Linux Luddites, episode 74, for the 21st of March, 2016. Hello and welcome to Linux Luddites, the show where we try all the latest free and open source software and then decide that we like the old stuff better. I'm Joe. I'm Jesse. And I'm Paddy. A few days ago, Joe and I caught up with Jonathan Riddle to find out more about some of the exciting projects currently coming out of KDE, and also to talk a little about Jonathan's unresolved differences with Canonical. So stick around to hear that interview. But before that, we have a pretty busy news section this time. Should we just crack on? Yeah, let's do it. First up in the news, then, excellent Linux hardware-based news, and that is coming from Dell, and they're expanding their range of Ubuntu laptops. So as well as the XPS 13 developer edition, which they've had for a while and there's a new version of, there are also some bigger and more powerful machines available. Now, they're all quite expensive. They're not kind of the low-end ones that we talked about from eBuyer, but it's still good news, I think, that you can buy especially from a big name like Dell, some actual hardware that comes running Linux out of the box. Yeah, you do have to hunt around on their website a little bit to find them. But as you suggest, having such a major manufacturer showing some commitment in the space, I think it's really good. I am a little bit concerned, though, because I've heard that before they have to have custom kernels and stuff. So if you buy it and then you want to put Arch on it or whatever, then it's not going to be working straight out of the box. So it remains to be seen about these new ones. So it'd be a bit like buying an Apple product where the operating system that works on it works fine, but to then tinker with it and change it, you're going to have 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 problems, perhaps. Which is, you know, not really what I would say most of the people who run Linux are looking for. They're looking more like the System seventy six or Entryware type setup where the hardware has been selected so that it runs well with Linux, and therefore you can run anything on it. So it doesn't sound quite as rosy as, as maybe we introed it well that's the thing maybe they will have spent more time this time making sure that it is going to work with just mainline kernel stuff rather than needing these patches so we'll just have to see when they actually start coming out and people start using them and they are a manufacturer who actually do manufacture i mean a lot of these integrators, if you like. I mean, System76 is slightly different, but a lot of these box shifters in the Linux space just buy in machines from China and change a few odds and sods and, and punt it out as a Linux-ready piece of kit when they're clearly not. That's true, but as long as it works 100% with Linux and is decent quality hardware, then what's the difference? I mean, everything's made in China anyway, isn't it? Yeah, fair enough. I'll get back under my rock. <laughs> Well, shifting from hardware to software news, and Google have upped their bounty from $50,000 to $100,000 for anyone who is able to create a persistent compromise of a Chromebook when in guest mode. And not only have they doubled this bounty, which I think was the highest they had anyway, so they've, they've really pushed it as if you can get into the Chromebook whilst it's in guest mode, you know, please do and show us how it's done so they can improve the security. So not only have they upped it, but also it's now basically a bottomless pit. So rather than one a year or depending on which ones they got in, they would give it to the one that was the most complicated or or the most accessible that people could could use. Is now is anyone who is able to get in, no matter how many there are per year, they will pay out. So it's really showing that they're they're trying to get people to to hack on it and and improve the security all round. Well, I mean that's the face value of it, and uh, there's two ways of looking at it. Are they genuinely trying to improve the security, or are they just showing off that they've got really great security? I don't see what the difference is. Uh, um, well, it's, it's a quite a subtle difference, I suppose. But one is. Just they they know that they're not going to find any exploits, so they're not going to have to pay it out. And it makes for good headlines and good sort of clickbait, and you end up with people like us talking about it. Well, I think that goes it goes hand in hand. It's, it's an ideal thing to be able to be so confident in your operating system that you say, come on, you know, come, come and have a go if you think you're hard enough kind of thing, and we will pay you to do so, pay you handsomely, 
because who else is standing up saying that? You don't see Microsoft with this kind of money on on the table. So I, I understand what you're saying. It's clearly headlines, but the headlines for the right reason. And if you've got software which is that uh, robust and unable to be to be sort of taken apart, you may as well stand from the top and say, "Check us out. Why don't you all start using Chromebooks?" Yeah, and obviously a large part of the security within a Chromebook is within Chrome itself. And as we're recording this, Pwn to Own 2016 is just finished. And I noticed that although it's been reported, Chrome was successfully hacked. If you look into the details, it was actually a, with a bug that Google already knew about and then a variety of Windows and Flash exploits and such like. So it really is holding its own very, very well against the other browsers. Yeah, like you say, it's not as if they, they haven't paid out. Over the past six years since they've been in these these Pwn to Own competitions, they've paid out $6 million. So that's that's quite a lot of bounty that's been taken up. But each time they pay out, I guess they, they improve the security overall, don't they? Well, yeah, it's clearly working, isn't it? <laughs> it's the bottom line. It's It's a good system. And as you say, maybe Microsoft should do the same. Although, I don't know how many billions have they got. Probably not enough. <laughs> Well, let's leave talk of Microsoft until a little later in the news and stay with Google. And I saw a study that showed that about 8 out of 10 streaming media devices sold worldwide last year came from just four different manufacturers, those being Amazon, Apple, Google and Roku. And Google's Chromecast managed to capture about 35% of the whole market in 2015, making it the single best-selling device out there. And the article I'm going to stick in the show notes quotes an analyst pointing out that cost obviously plays a big factor here. And the Chromecast is clearly cheap enough to be an impulse buy. I mean, how many do you own, Jesse? Well, I thought about this the other day, and I am on five Chrome castable devices. So that there is a bit of a caveat there. There's two for which are HDMI, so they obviously plug into the TVs, and there are three audio Chromecasts, the new ones, the sort of round one that look like a little tiny uh, vinyl. And the reason I have three of those is because they sync up so I can have audio throughout my house all synchronized. And I have one usable Chromecast in the back of the TV, obviously, and like a spare. And, and that is the stupid thing. You're absolutely right. It's $35. So it's what, 30 quid or so. And it's for when I go away or I went to my parents and lent it to them for a bit. They are cheap enough that you can have that. But I do also own a Roku because for watching uh, media that you get off of iPlayer or 4OD or YouTube and things, it's actually, I kind of prefer flicking through the TV selections, especially if you're watching with someone. It's quite an awkward experience to look on your phone to find something to play on YouTube and the other person can't see what you're doing. Yeah, I must admit, it's one of these wonders of modern technology I've never actually had in my hands, as uh, many of the things we talk about on the show, like the Raspberry Pi, for instance. Uh, perhaps I'll have to have a nosy at some stage. Well, I don't own a TV, ha ha ha, but if I did, I probably would get a Chromecast, I reckon, because they are really useful, and I've used one uh, at my parents and stuff. But this has reminded me, actually, that because I don't have live TV, occasionally that's annoying and so it's not too bad to stream it from the iPlayer but if there are any listeners who have got experience of this can you please answer me this question what is the best cheap streaming box that will stream live TV in decent quality ideally 720 or up but also has audio out so I can connect it to my monitor and speakers rather than the TV so show at linuxlardites.com if you've got any ideas please so if you're doing that, will you be having to acquire a TV license? Ah, well, you know, you just don't let them in. Problem solved. <laughs> <laughs> Only for viewing American content or something, I guess, then. Well, no, for live UK TV. Um, I'm, I'm not worried about the TV license thing. It's fine. But you even for watching iPlayer, soon you're going to need that. But... Uh, no, uh, I don't care about a TV license. As I said, you just don't invite them in and it's problem solved. Don't reply to letters or anything. I don't think Linux Luddites endorses not paying your TV license. It does. <laughs> <laughs> don't pay the teletax. No, do what you want. But going back to this article, Paddy, you mentioned that there were the the four manufacturers there. Uh, Google and Apple, obviously, big in big, all the tech that you're going to get. Roku and Amazon, which I think... Amazon is is pretty much trying to get into the tablet and the TV market just to get you to buy their their content, their downloadable content. But while I get the impression the article sort of says there's only four, 
at least that's a lot better than the situation we have with phones, where there's basically only two. And while, you know, two of them are the big phone manufacturers or the big phone operating systems, there is more diversity. And Roku only does streaming boxes. That is their niche. That is their their skill set. So I, I don't know how many more you would need for it to be a competitive market, because I think that, that's competitive enough. Well, the Google one obviously is winning Android, and Amazon Fire devices are some mutilated version of Android as well. I don't know about Roku, because I've never seen one of those either in the flesh. I mean, is that Android-based, or is that some proprietary thing? I'm pretty sure it's proprietary. No, it's actually a modified version of Linux running on the Roku box. Well, but the thing is is that you can't really say that, I mean, you can say that the Chromecast is running Android, but it looks nothing like Android. It, it, it may all have the fundamentals of it there, but then before you know it, where, where does it stop just becoming a little Linux plug-in box? It's, it's not like it's looking like Android. It's very much just a, a screen device and, and you cast to it. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the problem with them running the same software is when they're coming from different uh, device manufacturers and they're all trying to put their own spin on it. And so they're all getting money for the hardware going into different people's pockets. Well, I never really thought about the competition aspect of it, but I think it is healthier than the, the phone one, as we said. So yeah, although there's room for improvement, it's better than it could be. And so I mentioned with the Dell laptops that they're not necessarily running a mainline kernel, and that is something that phones are definitely not doing. Even though it's a Linux kernel, it's very much not the mainline one. But there was a Google Plus post this week showing a demo of an XS7 running a mainline kernel. So are we a step closer to it? I suppose a very small step closer. Well, if we just go back into why the mainline kernel isn't used, am I right in saying that's because phone hardware has many niche devices and things that, because you don't find them in main PCs, Linux hasn't got drivers and things supporting them. So maybe the accelerometers, for example, won't have drivers, so it's been hacked together. Is Is that what we're talking about? Well, yeah, and also because the hardware moves at such a fast pace. Whereas with laptops, if you buy a brand new one, it might not be 100% supported. Maybe the sound won't work or whatever for a while, but then the kernel team will catch up and they'll put that driver in there. Whereas with phones, you're getting new components all the time and they just can't keep a pace with that. And so the only option is to have a custom kernel. Yeah, there's also the proprietary blob aspects. A lot of these... uh specific devices come out from the manufacturer only with proprietary blobs and as you suggest the lifetime isn't long enough to warrant trying to reverse engineer them so this isn't the one that's being supplied by google so google's producing android and lg will make their own kernel underneath that for android to run on top of and so lg it will be the people who i'm trying to work out who should be sending the the patches and the information back into mainline kernel it should be the the hardware manufacturer not google yeah and this nexus 7 thing that joe was talking about is still moderately heavily patched but an awful lot of the work's been done and been put upstream and that's really what the story is about is the fact that the work currently doesn't tend to get pushed back upstream and therefore the people can't benefit from it but if we could get more of that going on and a more consistent use of something resembling a mainline kernel it opens up the possibility of community support for devices and far easier porting of things. It's not really a surprise that they've started with the tablet rather than the phone because the tablet doesn't have that the radio hardware that will never be open sourced. Yeah, and as you suggested earlier, the life expectancy of devices like a Nexus 7 is slightly longer than the average phone these days. Yeah, I would have thought so. Well, look at the fact there isn't a new one out yet. Yeah, it's a good point, actually. Well, tablet sales are declining, aren't they? You know, whether we'll see another Nexus 7 ever, I'm not really sure, because if you noticed when the Android N uh, beta program was announced, the Nexus 7 was conspicuous by its absence. Yeah, don't I know it. <laughs> it was on pretty much all the other ones, even the Nexus 6, but yeah, not on the Nexus 7. But that's because phones are getting bigger, isn't it? The, there's not really any point having a tablet now when you've got an enormous phone and a small laptop. The, the tablet just sort of, it doesn't, it's not that useful. It's not as useful as it once was when phones were sort of three and a half, four inches. Now they're five inches plus. It, it seems less useful to have a seven inch device. And so I don't use my Nexus 7 
that much anymore really i mostly use it for sticking ubuntu on there and trying out different roms and stuff yeah i, I completely agree joe since we looked at ubuntu use my nexus 7 for it it has actually still got ubuntu on it it just hasn't been reflashed back to android it's been it's literally sat on my bedside table i can see it now and it hasn't been turned on since we did that review and i keep on meaning to get round to it but like you say i've got a chromebook i've got my android phone on me all the time some things are nicer on a slightly bigger screen but Often it's just uh, it's just easy with the phone. But speaking of phones, and we go round to the inevitability of there being some sort of hack, and this is the discussion on going back to stage fright. And an Israeli software company have successfully remotely hacked a phone using the stage fright exploit. So they've done it on a Nexus Five, LG G Three, HTC One, and a Samsung. And this vulnerability is is available or available is the wrong word is there on 2.2 4 and 5 and 5.1 of android so a lot of the hardware that's out there at the moment is still running 4 still running 5 and so it means that there are many many phones which could in theory be remotely hacked yeah it means the usual story you can go into a shop now and buy a low-end phone and it will be vulnerable and it will probably never be updated and surely there should be I don't know, should there be a law against that? Or is that a bit too heavy-handed, big government? It just seems a bit ridiculous that you can go and buy a machine of any description, a computer, which we're talking about here, that is vulnerable to pretty serious remote exploits and never, ever see an update for it. Yeah, I'm always surprised that you don't get the same warranty with the software running on the hardware as you do with the hardware. You know, if my phone broke after six months physically, I'd get a new one. I think in the EU it's it's two years for, for new equipment. So why isn't that, you know, instilled on the software side as well? I think they'd argue the software is still working. It's just it isn't necessarily providing the level of protection you actually want now. I mean, it still is achieving its original functionality, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I guess it is. Let's stay with small devices. And we've talked about the BBC Microbit project a couple of times before on the show, um, including mentioning that it was held up due to power issues, but it now seems to have landed finally. And it's a tiny device. It measures about 4 centimetres by 5 centimetres. Um, it's designed for 3.3 volt power, and it's got a 5x5 five five matrix of LEDs on the board and a 25-pin GPIO setup and a micro USB port, which apparently you'll need to use to get code onto it, um, because if you try using the Bluetooth, which is its other claim to fame, it's horrendously slow. Now, this is going to be free to all UK Year 7 kids, which is the first year of secondary school. Which is what, 12? It is 12, there or thereabouts. It obviously depends what time of the year you're born, but yeah, 12-year-olds. Um, the link I'm going to put in the show notes is a review, and it draws quite a stark distinction between things like the Raspberry Pi and the Microbit, and they suggest that whilst you can view the Pi as a full-blown microcomputer, albeit not a very powerful one, you really ought to be looking at the microbit as a microcontroller. And they point out some of the differences, like um, the fact the microbit only has 16K of onboard RAM, for instance. Yeah, and running at 16 megahertz for the CPU, you're not going to ask it to play HD video or anything. So I think it's a, a fairly good thing to sort of clarify that the Raspberry Pi you're going to be running and you should be expecting it to look like a PC, whereas this, it's going to be running, but only to run very simple code and make lights turn on and, and things like that. Yeah, we talked about Python running on this on a previous show. Um, as I mentioned a minute ago, though, what does seem quite important to me is the fact that it supports Bluetooth, and I can see that being really useful for the sort of projects you might want to use this with. I think the other very clever design feature it's got is the the connector, which allows you to just push the entire board into some sort of adapter, which then picks up all the, I think it's 15 pins. Whereas if you wanted to just use crocodile clips or those little uh, sort of electrical board plugs that go in, you can pick the main five. So it's got plus three and ground and then three uh, variable ones that you can control lights and other bits and bobs which are outside of the board so it's got some real good features for being able to integrate it both with more complicated circuits requiring all 15 of the pins or very simple circuits that just have those three that are a bit more kind of robust for kids to play with so quite a well thought out thing and i know we said it was 40 mil by 50 mil which i think if we translate for our american listeners like 
what, 17 inches by three furlongs or something. It's, it's, <laughs> it's very small. Yeah, it's about two inches by just under two inches. So fairly small, certainly compared to Raspberry Pi, although not necessarily compared to a Raspberry Pi Zero. But you remember, Joe, we're not allowed to compare it to a Raspberry Pi anymore. Oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah. But what concerns me, and I hate to be negative, no, I don't, I love being negative, ha, ha, ha. But if you go to try and program this thing, you go to a website, and then it's just all Microsoft this, Microsoft that, and it's very disappointing. Well, let's go back to the last show when you were sort of discussing your trip over to Raspberry Pi Towers and the fact that their goal was purely to educate and to inform the, you know, the youth of today, the children, and they had no real qualms with using Microsoft and they had no huge bonus or, or push to, to make people use Linux. And I'm afraid to say this is very much in the same ballpark, isn't it? Yeah, because there's this huge emphasis on getting kids into coding because it has been decided... And it seems to be just an axiom at this stage that kids need to get into coding. And I suppose I'm not going to argue with that. But there seems to be absolutely no emphasis at all on software freedom. And that's because most people don't care about it. Most people don't know about it. And so the the higher ups, as it were, who organize these things don't really care. It's, does it work? Can we get it in front of kids? Can we get some code running on there, flashing some lights, making some motor spin or whatever. And the idea of the fact that it should be free software and open source just doesn't seem to be getting pushed. It just seems to be totally lost. And it it seems like a huge missed opportunity to me. But what can you do? Most people run Windows on their laptop and use Linux on the Raspberry Pi because that's just what's available for it. And Windows 10 Internet of Things is less capable. But if Microsoft came along and made a a perfectly good desktop version of Windows for the Raspberry Pi, as unlikely as that is, I think you'd find most people would use it. Certainly most people in the educational sector. I'm not talking about the kind of people who listen to this show who enjoy making NAS boxes and whatever and running Ubuntu Mate or, or... even Raspbian on it. But the vast majority of the people who these things are aimed at, the Raspberry Pi and the Microbit, don't care about software freedom. Well, no, that's not even true. Don't know about it. And I will probably never hear about it. Well, thanks for uh, harshing my mellow. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I don't know. I feel like I'm being overly negative here. But the fact is that kids are going to get into coding. And probably i mean it's kind of the default position that that code is open because it's kind of like going back to the olden days of the first days of computing that stallman likes to romanticize about where there was no need for software freedom or open source because that was just the default position and the idea of making it proprietary came a bit later and i suppose maybe we're returning to that now where the code that these kids are using will just be shared and they won't even think about the license it's just you know why do you need a license it's this code they'll just post on their blog or whatever with no no license attached to it it's just this will make this work and and so maybe i suppose it is a positive thing in a way that we're just getting away from this idea of being bogged down in software licenses because people don't care about that well the other positive takeaway is that let, let's say 10 percent of people who learn to code do so for an open source project or with open source software and a hundred people learn to code one year and because of all these these initiatives a thousand people learn to code you get 10 times the number of people making open source code okay there may be the majority of them still in proprietary land but there will just be more people making code also i think that with the huge push to cloud um, computing and the fact that Linux is basically the default in that in that world, and we'll again come back to the Microsoft sort of stories later, but everyone's moving over to that that side. So in 10, 15 years, when you know children that are at school now become the coders of the future, their world will be a lot more based on Linux and open source projects and code that runs in the cloud and all these sorts of things. And whereas people who would have grown up in a proprietary world, you know, post-Stallman, will have thought, well, proprietary is the way to go. So, 
you know, perhaps there is going to be this this gentle shift over away from making things which are proprietary to more people coding generally, you would hope, and those people doing it in a world where Linux servers and all these huge deployments are using open source software. Has, has that at least returned some of your mellow paddy? It has a little bit, yes. And it's also a wonderful segue to the next story, which is all to do with these sort of devices in the form of the Raspberry Pi and also cloud computing. Um, last December, OwnCloud announced they were partnering with Western Digital to look at creating a self-hosted cloud solution using Raspberry Pi 2s, um, Western Digital hard disks, and their own software. And this project appears to have progressed somewhat. And last Friday, they announced that the first distro images, which are being based on Snappy Ubuntu Core 1604, are available to download. And they seem to be being pretty honest about all of it and cautioning that early adopters will have some pain. And I think this is partly down to the general setup and partly down to 1604 being rough around the edges still. But they've said that if testing goes well over the next few days, um, Western Digital will be looking to ship about 30 or so prototype devices that you'll be able to order online. And longer term, they're planning to move from the Pi 2 to the Pi 3 as the basis for this platform. Well, it all sounds good, this, doesn't it? That you'll be able to buy a kit, effectively, that you can just plug in and set up via a web browser on your network, and you'll have an on-cloud instance going. Taking all of the pain and the, the setup and creating databases and all the hassle that most people can't be bothered with away, and just leaving you with more people using own cloud. I was going to say leaving you with the pain of using own cloud. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, Paddy. They are very open about it. The the box that they've got in the in the demo video has a picture of a hard disk, as you'd expect, and it's called the Western Digital Pi Drive, and it's got two big Raspberry Pi logos on the front, engineered for Raspberry Pi. It, it's not like they're trying to sort of say, "Oh, look at our clever little storage device, which has got a mini computer in it," or any of that. They're just saying. This is how it is, and go and use it. It's the best, you know, hardware for the job, or at least the most available hardware. Yeah, I might be being a little snarky, but I think these are really good sort of initiatives because a lot of people out there aren't capable or just simply don't want to go through the pain of configuring all these sort of things themselves. So if you can buy the bits, know it's going to work together when you plug it in, that's terrific. And hot on the back of that, we can announce that OwnCloud 9 has been released. So there's a few of their, the main items here is commenting and tagging. So if someone's got a shared document, you can add comments to it so other people can see. Uh, you can also tag files and folders, which means that you can say, you know, holiday and summer and 2015. And then when you search by those tags, you can find them. There's a reworked notification pane for when you log in and, and various files have been updated. And they've also allowed you to do easier sharing between own cloud servers. So if I wanted to share my hypothetical own cloud server with Joe's hypothetical never going to happen own cloud server, then there's an easy way to do that. And you can sort of have a, a approved friendship backs and forwards so we can look at each other's files and edit them as well. So it sounds like a number of, of improvements and they sort of go through, there's going to be a new updater as well so that from nine and upwards, you can hopefully make the updating process smoother. But is it going to sync your files without breaking? Well, they do say that because groups like CERN and some other big scientific outfits uh, are keen on increasing the amount of capacity. They've got a new storage API, which allows you to handle a lot more users and a lot bigger files. Whether or not that means that you can definitely upload all your files and it not forget them, corrupt them, or just delete them, I'm not so sure, because I also have heard some uh, horror stories from people about it eating their files and data. But that was previous versions, wasn't it? So maybe 9 is the version that is actually going to work. But I forget, was it 7 or 8 that we looked at? And I remember that my takeaway was it felt like 0.7 or 0.8. So maybe this is 0.9 and they're almost there. And I really should check it out before I criticize it, I think. But I'll tell you one thing they are doing right, and that's having major point releases on a very frequent basis. Because clearly I pulled together the news for the show, or the majority of it, and I put this in because I thought a lot of the listeners tend to use own cloud, and it's another major release. But then looking back through the previous notes, as you say, version 7 we talked about on show 24, version 8 we talked about on show 37. So they're very much like canonical, and by putting out a regular 
supposedly major change, um, they're getting press every time. So you think it's just cynical marketing then? Moi? <laughs> well, a project that has definitely never done any cynical marketing in its uh, existence is Ubuntu Mate, or Ubuntu Martin, as they call it on System AU. And you've put a story in here from OMG Ubuntu that says, yeah, another reason why Ubuntu Mate 6004 will rock. And I get the feeling that you're going to be the negative one on this, Paddy, for a change. Because what we're talking about here is client-side decorations. Now, for those who don't know what that is, instead of your window manager drawing the title bar and the close and maximize and stuff, buttons, applications can do it, specifically GNOME applications. And so in this new version of Ubuntu Mate, which is coming out pretty soon, it's going to have decent support for applications that want to do that, which sounds all well and good to me. Can't really argue with it. Why not support it? Not everyone's going to like it, but you don't have to use it if you don't want to. No, of course, you wouldn't have to use the GNOME apps that actually implement this if you don't want to. I don't know. I have got very mixed views on this, though. I mean, I can understand Martin's pragmatism in putting this in because you want to provide the best experience possible to the end user. And if there are no maps out there that support this and look rubbish without it being supported, and there are, there's plenty of them as they keep moving them over, then I can see that. But also I can see that if they are having good support for this kind of nonsense in distributions that aren't GNOME-based, it will only encourage the GNOME devs to keep going down this path. And surely the only way to sort of stop them in their tracks is to deprive them of the oxygen that initiatives like this will actually provide. What, you think the GNOME devs care about anything other than GNOME? I don't, to be honest. And I don't think the rest of us should care about GNOME unless we are GNOME devs. So I really don't think Martin should probably have done this. Uh, I'm inclined to disagree. I think that some of the GNOME apps are good, are worth using, and therefore you need client-side decorations to make them work properly. Okay, I would counter with some Windows apps are very good and people want to be using Windows apps. Does that mean we should be making sure that Office 2016 or whatever it is is supported properly under Wine? Well, that's different because it's proprietary. The GNOME stuff is open source still. So that's where your analogy falls down. But I do take your point. But then I don't take your point because Windows is proprietary and, and so is Office. No, but surely the, the point that I would make then is if they've made the application in such a way that it requires the window border to be functioning in a particular way, they've just made the application in a, a silly way. Sorry for all the ways. Yeah, I wish they have. I mean, it's the whole point of the GNOME thing to try and force you to use the whole environment. Uh, that's a very negative way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is it's all beautifully integrated. Yeah, but I can hear the sarcasm in your voice. <laughs> you, you're, you're falling apart on your own argument. Well, yeah. Look, if you're going to use a GNOME desktop, then it's all really nicely integrated, but it's the portability issue. And it means that people like Martin, who are working on other Linux desktop environments, have to do stuff like this rather than just being able to easily port over apps or no porting even required. You know, something that used to work in GNOME 2, you could just install in XFCE and it would work absolutely perfectly. Whereas now they're breaking compatibility with other desktop environments and window managers. And I think that's that's the crux of your argument, Paddy, isn't it? Yeah, it is really, yes. And considering the origins of Mate, um, and particularly Ubuntu Mate, it just seems to jar with the ethos that was behind the whole project initially. Uh, well, again, I disagree because it, it, retrospective future was always the tagline that it is doing things in a traditional way, but it also has an eye on the future and isn't going to be just left behind and be totally irrelevant. And you need to support things like this to stay relevant. Uh, as much as you don't want it to be true, it is. So can I just ask the question about client-side decorations? Now, is GNOME the only uh, desktop or, I suppose, application production machine which is supporting their own client-side decorations? Or are there other um, desktop environments which are forcing it through the toolkit and making those applications have it? I mean, let's say if Unity next week 
brought out their own client side decorations and so did KDE well sorry the plasma desktop wouldn't that mean that each application would look correct on each other's desktop yeah but you know that if they were going to do that they would do it all in a totally independent and separate way so they would all look wrong on each other's desktop right so the work the martin or the ubuntu mate team isn't now finished and everyone's client-side decorations will work no matter where they've come from now this is support for gnome and i mean that is where client-side decorations are being driven from i'm not aware of it occurring in other projects yet 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 anyway Move it on. Oh, it's me. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, move it on, Paddy. <laughs> okay. Um, over the last few months, we've had quite a few listeners recommend the Swiss-based Proton Mail service to us as a secure end-to-end encrypted mail platform. And Proton Mail's been invite only for a very long time now, and it's picked up about a million users that way. But they've announced that they're now opening things up to all and sundry. Um, they've also written iOS and Android apps for the service, and they've been punted out. And the web client was released from the MIT license last August, and they're promising code for the apps as well, although I couldn't actually find any when, when looking for it. Now, I know you've been having a nosy about at ProtonMail, Joe. Have you found any code for the Android app? No, I've just been using it in the browser on Android, and it works perfectly well for me. But no, I didn't look into installing an app at all, I'm afraid. So is there anything more difficult than just setting up, a, a, for example, a Gmail account? Well, you've got two passwords, basically. So you pick a username, and I actually get JRS. Yes. And I shouldn't have said that, should I? Now everyone will be emailing me. (laughs) Oh, well. Uh, I don't know whether I'm going to use this or not, but, uh, oh, well, there you go. But then you put in your password to access your account, but then you need a second password, which is not recoverable. So to access your account, they can recover it. It's just in their database or whatever. Whereas the encryption password is not. And so you have to be able to remember it. And they say, if you forget this, you can't access your mail anymore. So I didn't try putting the same password for both. Maybe I should have done, but I would hope that you can't do that. But then once you've done it, it's just straight up email and i sent you guys one you didn't even know because i deleted the signature but there is an option to encrypt your mail and so i could send you guys uh, on your gmail accounts an email from this encrypt it and then instead of my email you'll just get a message saying hey you've received an encrypted email click this link to check it out which just reeks of phishing scam to me but there you go And I tried this out. I have to create a password, basically. And then I have to tell you that password by some other means. So... What is it? Go on. What is it? (laughs) Well, the password I tried was X, just to test it out, because I didn't want to uh, mess around. And once I had done that, I I clicked the link and put in my password, and it worked. So it, it seems to all work really well. I'm not surprised that it's been so popular. I guess we come back to the old conundrum about longevity of services to be honest i mean something like gmail you don't expect to disappear overnight because it's proved so popular where something like this that's got a million two million whatever it is users the potential there is for it to vanish tomorrow which would leave you high and dry really well there is always that risk but as long as you've got a copy of your email that you want to keep locally then i suppose it's just the inconvenience of losing the address which could be a major inconvenience if you use this as your primary email account. But then again, how much do you really want to worry about this stuff? It seems like it's a very popular service, so I don't think it will go away. But I suppose the VC funding might disappear, and then so might it. Yeah, you mentioned venture capital there. I mean, looking on Wikipedia, it says that they started out being crowdfunded. I can't remember this ever happening, but clearly if it's on Wikipedia, it must be true. <laughs> yeah, it must be. That's where the facts are kept, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't remember it either, but clearly it's one of those ones where a lot of people have been crying out for it, especially after Snowden, and, and that got off the ground. And now it uses a sort of tiered funding model, so you get bonus features and extra abilities if you pay the price. Oh, maybe it has got some legs then. You never know. 
And one of our favorite organizations that definitely has legs, having been going for 30 years, is the FSF. And they have posted a preliminary analysis of their high-priority projects feedback. So just over a year ago, they put out a call for feedback with regards to their high-priority projects. And now they've kind of collated all that data and have changed some of their ideas. And so what, what their high priority projects are, are things that need a free software replacement. So taking one example would be Google Earth. And so instead of a horrible proprietary version, we need a free software version. Well, now they don't think we do because it doesn't fit into their four categories, which to quote their website is something that has the potential to improve lots of free software programs or development communities advocacy that sort of thing. Universal, something which everyone needs, but there's no free software equivalent. Cascading, which is something that replaces a piece of proprietary software, but also kind of leads on to being able to use other bits of free software. And then Frontier, which is kind of more about the the low-level stuff. So Core Boot would be a good example of that, or, or Libre Boot at least. So software that is is low level kind of hardware driver that kind of thing, and it seems like reasonable focus really. They they've kind of looking through the long list of stuff like Ganache for example they have removed because they say that Flash once used to be well ubiquitous didn't it it was everywhere whereas now Flash is pretty irrelevant or it's it's certainly losing relevance and so having a free software version of it Ganache. It's just not really a priority anymore. Yeah, and another one of the pieces of software they're talking about is a replacement for Skype. And they've this is obviously used by a large number of people as both audio as we are and video chat and conferencing. Um, but now that time has moved on and there are a number of proprietary voice and video chat clients, they're going to change it to f- a free software replacement for real-time voice and video chat, which I think is, is needed. And, and the ones that we've heard about haven't been good enough for us to move to so it is clearly something that needs to be improved upon yeah imagine there was something that was as good or better than skype but was free software that would be amazing if they they could have the compression algorithms and everything and i'd really really love to see that Uh, what's also funny is they they mentioned a video editor and they talk about blender as being the best one even though that's not a video editor i remember when we had campbell barton on the show uh, what feels like a couple of years ago now, he talked about how they just threw that together in a weekend or something, and and yet that's still considered the best video editor on Linux. Not a good situation, really. But can we universally agree that the FSF have done something right here with this? A slight dissenting voice, um, as you'd expect. I think on the whole they have, to be honest. I think most of their decision-making seems quite sensible, but there were a couple of things that did jump out at me as being rather odd. I mean, one of the things they're saying they're going to take on board is creating uh, some sort of Siri replacement. And apart from the fact this seems like total frippery to me, all these digital, personal digital assistants seem absolute nonsense to me. I mean, isn't that what the Mycroft project's all about? Well, I was just going to say Mycroft. That is literally the point of it. So maybe they just haven't heard of it yet. Don't these um, sort of personal assistants, like you're saying, go a little bit against the sort of privacy side of things where for them to be useful, they have to know everything about you? Or is is that completely glossed over because it's running on your own server and therefore you're, you're in control at least? Well, yeah, I mean, there's no privacy concern if it's only talking to hardware that's on your network that you have complete control over. Yeah, and in fairness, I mean, that is a point they flag up. They They say that... We believe a free software personal assistant is crucial to preserve users' control over their technology and data while still giving them the benefits such software clearly has for many. It's the the benefits that I would quibble at, really, because I don't think that these things are anything other than frippery, but that's just my view. Um, The other thing I I wanted to pick up on, really, was the fact that they are dropping any endeavours to create a free software replacement for BitTorrent Sync. Yeah, that jumped out at me as well, because that is something that would be amazing. I mean, I tried out BitTorrent Sync when it first came out, and I was really, really impressed with it, and I had incorrectly assumed that it was open source. And then 
a couple of weeks into using it, I found out, oh, no, hang on, it's actually proprietary. And I was gutted because it meant that I just wasn't going to use it anymore. But if we could get something that works as well as BitTorrent Sync and be open source, that would be amazing. And we've talked about before the various things you can do with rsync and whatever, but in terms of plug and play just works, to use a phrase that I hate, BitTorrent Sync is amazing. And so it is a bit odd that the FSF don't deem that important enough to to be on this list, because I would love to see one as well. Yeah, because we looked at uh, three alternatives to BitTorrent Sync, uh, Paddy and I in a show, well, quite a few shows ago now, and we didn't come to the conclusion that there was one that we both agreed was excellent. There were There were some that you could have a small caveat here and there with, but nothing that we have carried on to use as far as I know. Absolutely. And... I mean, this kind of ties back into the own cloud thing that we were talking about earlier, because I can remember when we talked about own cloud originally, when we looked at version seven, I had a little bit of a rant, as is my want. Um, something like a free version of BitTorrent Sync is so fundamental to the internet and actually getting away from our reliance upon big companies and having all these mesh technologies available to us. And there's so much can be built on top of it. I mean, I think we talked about the fact that Someone has developed a, a Twitter replacement, for instance, that runs on top of this. So it's a, a federated mesh Twitter client. That, but it requires the transport medium there. And if you treat BitTorrent Sync as a transport mechanism and think of it as not just transferring files about, but also what sort of files you could be transferring about and the services that could be taking advantage of that, I, I think it's absolutely crazy that they don't consider it important when it it clearly is to actually break our reliance upon a lot of these big data providers. Uh, maybe you should have written to them in the first place, Paddy, when they asked for the feedback. I'm probably on their blacklist, aren't I? <laughs> I would have thought so. <laughs> <laughs> well, moving on, and the next news story is that the Let's Encrypt Foundation, or amalgamation of companies, have released their millionth certificate. So it's been going for three months and five days, or at the time of the news story, since the beta version became public. And they've been going at sort of 100,000 certificates a week without that really changing very much. And so it's taken just that short amount of time for a million independent people um, to require those certificates. And you would hope release them on the live web. So moving from HTTP over to HTTPS. So the Let's Encrypt client has been renamed or is going to be renamed. We don't know quite to what yet. And it's also going to a new home at the EFF. Yeah, apparently the EFF actually led development for the clients. And although it was being stewarded by the Let's Encrypt project, they're really wanting to concentrate on the server side of things. So that is going to be shunted off as a separate project now. The other interesting thing I thought about all of this was how many new certificates were being issued, and not just by Let's Encrypt, but for new domains. I mean, when I first saw the stats about a million certificates being issued, my first thought was whether it was actually just taking certificates away from paid authorities and how much of it really was new people coming into the HTTPS fold, if you like. And a blog post by the EFF um, points out the numbers quite nicely by saying that about 90% of these are certificates for domains that haven't previously been encrypted, which is surprising, but really welcome, I guess, uh, providing, obviously, we think HTTPS is a good idea. But as for the kind of cannibalizing other certificate authorities' business, I don't think we can know that for sure yet, because isn't a typical certificate a year? I mean, I know these Let's Encrypt ones are a lot shorter than that, but if you've got one already, then you're going to wait until that expires before you get a new one, or at least close to the expiration date. So maybe we'll see in the next few months more and more people moving over from paid CAs to Let's Encrypt. Yeah, I'd really like to have a look at the numbers sort of in a year's time or so, and we can see how that's panned out, because I suspect they are going to take an awful lot of business away from the paid authorities, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, what could a paid authority offer that this doesn't? Well, technically, this is just a domain verified authority. So if you can prove ownership and control of the domain, um, they will give you a certificate, whereas the more expensive ones out there, they're supposed to prove you exist in the physical world and that your offices are registered at a certain address and all this. And um, how much of that actually goes on and how much of it's just marketing speak, I don't know. I mean, Douglas Crockford, who's famous for his work on JavaScript, has always said the only 
thing that having a VeriSign certificate tells you is that you've paid some money to VeriSign at some stage. I think probably sounds fairly true, to be honest. But thinking about JavaScript, we spoke about WebAssembly on the um, show before, and this is a portable programming language for in-browser scripting, and it's designed to be faster to parse and execute than JavaScript itself. And it's being developed by a W3C community group whose members include Mozilla, Microsoft, Google, and Apple. And experimental support for WebAssembly is apparently now available in Chrome Canary builds and also the Firefox Nightlies. And Microsoft Edge support is being worked on as well. Now, I've not actually tried this out, so I can only assume it does work. Um, mind you, every news story I've read about it has used the same screenshot of an Angry Bots game. So I guess none of the journalists have given it a whirl either. Have you two looked at this at all? I'm afraid I didn't get round to it. Yeah, similarly here, I haven't had a look. But the thing that sort of piqued my interest was was the four names. Was Apple, massive, obviously, Google, Microsoft, huge companies, and Mozilla. And the reason I picked that out is because we often talk about how Mozilla are getting less relevant and their market share is going down, and so they might just fade into the background or have no kind of involvement in some of the big decisions. Yet... They are one of four members who are who are creating this. And so does that not show that they are still relevant up along with the big players who make the big browsers? Well, it shows that they want to be. <laughs> Whether they actually are or not is a different matter. You mean there might be board meetings where the four of them are discussing it as long as uh, Google, Apple and Microsoft agree they just ignore Mozilla's little word? <laughs> Probably, yeah. I think it's worth remembering that WebAssembly is largely brainchild of Brendan Eich, who was at one stage heavily involved in Mozilla until he got the boot. Ah, oh, that may explain it then, yeah. Yeah, it looks like the baby hasn't been thrown out with the bathwater on this occasion. Well, this hasn't been the first time that we've mentioned Microsoft during the news, and obviously if you have your ear to the ground of the press, you'll have heard quite a few Microsoft stories, and this last bit of the news section, we're just going to run through those and, and have a quick look. So uh, which one are we starting off with? Well, let's start with SQL Server. That is going to be available on Linux starting from next year properly, although there are some kind of beta programs before that. And this is one that's made a huge impact on the Linux and open source news sphere. And I, I don't know whether that's justified or not, really, because we are just talking about a piece of proprietary software that's available for Linux. But then again, it does show that Microsoft is taking it seriously as a market um, i mean this is not something that a desktop user is going to use this is very much the enterprise server side of things and uh, it, it's just straight business isn't it there is a clear market for this otherwise they wouldn't be doing it and so microsoft want to make some more money by selling it for linux as well as windows server yeah unless if you're an oracle user of course in which case you've been given a very very sweet deal, and uh, offered free upgrade or downgrade, whichever way you look at it. So the, the question that I have, and I'm hoping you can answer this, Paddy, is what advantages does Microsoft SQL Server have over the open source alternatives that we've already got on Linux? Yeah, I think that question actually ties in with what will be delivered because they've promised base database functionality. But a lot of the goodness around the edges is what makes SQL Server very appealing to people in the corporate environment. And clearly that relies on parts of Windows being there, which won't be there on a Linux server. So it's very unclear at this stage how much of that functionality is going to be ported over or can be ported over to Linux and therefore make it a similarly appealing platform as Windows is. Oh, so we're not even talking about feature parity here necessarily? No, they've been very clear it won't be feature parity. Ah. So that seems a bit pointless then when you've got plenty of open source and, and free as in beer solutions for that in Linux already. Why would anyone want to do this if you're not even going to get these fancy features that you can have on a Windows server? Seems a bit strange. But I suppose some people might not need all of the features. They just kind of need some of the core feature set of it and they want to move over to Linux. But yeah, it's a bit confusing really. Yeah, and you've got to remember the licensing cost implications as well, though. I mean, it's not just SQL Server itself. Historically, SQL Server has always run on top of Windows, and in that environment, Windows costs money. The licenses for the Windows Server cost money, and Linux licenses, well, unless you're paying Red Hat some money, it doesn't cost a hill of beans, does it? 
Yeah, so I'm not going to uh, claim to be the world's expert on on Microsoft programs and and servers and whatnot. But like you said, Joe, if if someone's using a SQL Server and it's just to use a, a database, they could move it over to Linux because they're likely to have other things on Linux servers. As we said earlier, how many servers there are running various brands of Linux. But if you're an actual Microsoft shop and you're running Outlook and Office and you've got things like SharePoint and all these sorts of things, they will all tie into SQL Server and an Exchange Server. So it's probably that if you're ingrained in Microsoft, you have to stay on Microsoft. But if you only have a small portion of things using SQL Server and everything else is on Linux, you can just transfer over and put everything onto Linux now. So is this a stepping stone to get Exchange running on Linux then? Well, I think that is probably part of the bigger question as to how is Microsoft repositioning themselves to make money, which is sort of the, the crux of the, of the discussion here, I think. Because the way I see it, while the Windows proportion share of um, enterprise PCs is probably not going to take a massive decline, they are losing out on the server side, and they're going to have to just accept that they are not doing as well as Linux. As you said, Paddy, if you want to spin up 10 instances or 50 instances of a Linux server, you're done without having to do anything complicated with licenses and things. And that means that Microsoft is never going to get into that market now that it's started on Linux, because it's just so much more complicated and so much more expensive. And so what they're going to have to do is accept that while people might not spin up Microsoft servers, you can still run Microsoft code on top of it. So things like the SQL Server and increasing compatibility of other products they produce with Linux, just basically to sit on top of it. Yeah, and you mentioned both Exchange and um, SharePoint there, Jesse. And I think if we ever saw those come over to Linux, that would be very interesting indeed. I mean, something that strikes me about this whole debate, I've not heard anyone else really talking about on other Linux shows that I listen to, is how it will affect the Linux ecosystem. Because we take it as read that our products are as good as Microsoft's and we can compete And I'm not convinced that's entirely the case with some of these offerings. Well, surely that's a good thing then, because competition drives innovation. I'd certainly see it as a good thing uh, for exactly the reason you've mentioned, Joe. Um, I think once the penny drops for a few folks that that competition is going to be there. Might have some slightly different opinions coming from various folks, though. Opinions like what? Well, I think in truth that for some of the spaces these products occupy, People in the open source world have been doing a particularly good job. I mean, you think about the open source equivalent of Exchange, say, and there have been various products punted over the years, none of which has really stuck in the marketplace. And although we sort of humour ourselves that we are producing competing products, I think if these Microsoft offerings ever did appear on Linux, we'd see fairly rapidly that they aren't actually stacking up particularly well, the open source alternatives. And that probably isn't going to be a very popular opinion. And I hope, as you suggest, it will actually drive people to innovate and produce better alternatives on our platform. But I think it's going to be a little bit of a culture shock initially. It also is only going to drive competition in the server space. So, I mean, all of these things that are going on, while that that space is quite hotly contested and everyone's vying to get in and, and be the bigger part of it, it does sort of leave the, the desktop side somewhat languishing in the background doesn't it yeah i mean almost all of this is service i were talking about or development i mean microsoft also announced they were integrating visual studio with eclipse and joining the eclipse foundation and pushing out uh, open source network components uh, in the form of sonic which apparently is not a hedgehog but is a slightly labored acronym for software for open networking in the cloud and it is very much cloud stuff and server side stuff, as you suggest, Jesse. And it's all about driving people to use Azure. But Linux installations on Azure are climbing, aren't they? That if you look at the stats for it, more and more people are running Linux on it. It seems odd to me that you'd pick a Microsoft sort of back end to have Linux running on top of. Perhaps these are companies who have Microsoft, you know, very ingrained in Microsoft and realize they need to run x y or z application on linux so i need to install linux and pop it on there but even if that is the case 
and I know it's a bit of a, a niche, but even if that is the case, it does at least show that a number of companies or those companies would be turning to to have to run Linux, whereas previously they might have been getting away with just running Windows on Azure. Well, isn't it you never get fired for buying Windows? Oh, no, that's something different, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, not quite. <laughs> well, that's far too much talk about Microsoft. I think we should call that a day with the news, and let's move on. On to the feedback then. First of all, a huge thanks to Robert H. Nunnally Jr. for your PayPal donation. Very much appreciated. And also to our new monthly supporters, Amateur Zen Trading Company. Strange name. And Joseph Axel. Again, guys, very, very much appreciated. Helps us keep the lights on. And of course, to our existing monthly supporters. We couldn't do this without you. So contact details. You can email show at linuxluddites.com or on Twitter at linuxluddites. Or if you look on the website, there's a link to the Google Plus and Facebook communities, or you can leave a comment on the website. Okay, now we've done the whole news and well done on the contact details and everything, but there is the big announcement, and I'm glad we've got to this part of the show. Yes, Foss Talk Live 2016. But what's that, I hear you ask? That is an event that I am organizing with a bit of help from you, Jesse, but it's I have to do all the website and everything, so I'm taking all the credit. And it's going to be an evening of free Linux podcasts on Saturday, the 6th of August, 2016. And it's going to be Linux Voice, the Ubuntu podcast, and us. And then at the end of the night, there's going to be a drunken fiasco <laughs> starring Stuart Langridge and Dave Mega Slippers from Geek News Radio. Fab couldn't come over. He's too busy being on TV or something. So it should be good fun anyway. It's in quite a small basement in a pub, so tickets are very limited. But it's free because the venue is free, so we don't need to charge anything. So if you go to fosstalk.com, that's where the links to tickets and everything on Eventbrite are. And I do urge you get a ticket as soon as possible because there really are a small number of tickets available for this. But the upstairs in the, the pub is reasonably big, and it, there's, there's an outside section as well. It's essentially an excuse to all get together and get drunk and catch up. But it's also nice that there'll be live podcast recording happening. And I'm really, really looking forward to this. Yeah, I went and scoped out the venue with you, Joe. And uh, it's a it's a good little section downstairs with a stage and bits and bobs, own private bar, and a good opportunity to you know mingle and meet all the, the people that we listen to. So even we listen to the, the other podcasts and, and enjoy meeting them. Normally only get to do it at Old Camp, so it's a good excuse to have another one. It's in sort of central London, so, so fairly good transport links for everyone. I know Paddy's making the journey down from the far north. So I am indeed, yes. So, so even he'll be there. Yeah, so it's near King's Cross, which is relatively central London, uh, so it's pretty easy to get to from anywhere, really. So when was it happening again, Joe? So it's happening on Saturday the 6th of August, and we're going to start, well, the doors are going to open at 5, because that's when the, the pub opens, basically, and we'll have to start fairly early, because there's a lot of us uh, to do shows. But yeah, fosstalk.com is the place to check out uh, all the details about it, about the venue and everything. Yeah, so we're not doing full shows. We're not going to be doing a two-hour Linux Luddites and then another hour or so of, of Ubuntu podcast. But we are going to do a, a shortened bit, each have our time. And I'm a little bit worried because we're on stage first. So so perhaps have a, a couple of jars for Dutch Courage and uh, face the audience. Yeah, and some people have reached out and offered help for this. Now, the actual organisation of it is quite straightforward and has all been taken care of now. The only help that we're going to need is actually on the day. One of the major things is videoing it. If someone wants to volunteer to do that, uh, I'm not hugely keen to be on video, but I suppose it would be nice for someone to film the whole thing. And audio-wise, I think we've got it under control, but if someone wants to help record it, that might be useful. And also manning the door, if someone wants to uh, check the tickets and stuff to help us out, that could be useful. But it's quite a long way off, uh, and the the main thing is we've got the venue sorted now. It's all booked in, and we've got the tickets out there. But if you are interested in helping, you can email me via the Eventbrite page. Okay, well, let's get on with the feedback properly. So John got in touch and said, I was quite surprised that TinyCore is alive and kicking out new versions. As for use cases, I haven't used it lately, but when lashing up a router out of two nicks and an old, obsolete white box PC, TinyCore is the thing that was sure to run. 
I'd install to hard disk, make my minimal routing configurations, maybe add a packet filtering firewall and off it would go. Aside from running on anything, the other great thing about TinyCore was that unless something changed in my network, I could ignore it pretty safely. What, so no security updates then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by the sounds of it. I mean, we did cover the security side of things and the fact that every time you turn it off and turn it back on again, it reboots or reinstalls uh, to RAM from a known safe configuration. So it is actually sort of quite safe from that point of view. I'm not sure I'd be able to get on very well with it as a as a router. It seems a bit difficult to get the right software installed and things. I, I suppose I'm a little bit used to the plethora of software that's available on an Ubuntu server. Was that an intentional segue? It wasn't, but it seems to fit quite nicely. Crack on. Doesn't it just? Okay, Will got in touch as well and said, I don't see the need for peripherals as much of a problem for convergence. Where else do you need a full desktop experience besides your work and your home? You guys often make the point that smartphones are now fully-fledged computers that are close to being powerful enough for all everyday computing tasks. So isn't the point of convergence that you can ditch the desktop laptop you now keep at work and at home, and just use the same computing device that you normally carry with you between these places, at those places as well. There might be other places where it is occasionally useful to have access to peripherals, but if convergence actually is successful, I would expect docs to become widely available. So I'm very much on the fence with this. Partly I was entirely in agreement, Will. You made the fair point that you basically need a computer when you're sat at home and when you're sat in your office. Well, I think the majority of people have that situation if they're office-based. And yes, you're absolutely right. You should be able to take your phone, use it at home, same system, at work, everything's laughing. And, and so I was I was entirely sold on your point. But then I kind of thought, well, there's no way that what I want to run on my phone will ever be what my big corporation will want to run on theirs. I mean, for, for starters, I run Linux at home on my PC and they run Windows at work. And so unless you work for a very small company or a very open-minded company or integration of whatever you want to run at home and at work, maybe that's where the cloud comes in, where you don't have to actually run the operating system that everyone does. You just log into you know, Google Docs and make your amendments on, on shared documents and things. Unless that comes to a point of reality, it's never actually going to work from there. And then you kind of think, well, if the main argument there is that you run it with uh, peripherals at home and peripherals at work, but actually it's never going to work in my case, where are you going to go with these peripherals? And and we often make the case that, you know, your average friend is not going to have a Bluetooth keyboard and a Bluetooth mouse and a, a dongle approved by Ubuntu to cast it to the TV or what have you. So, um, again, I'm sort of exasperated as, as to which way this would fold. What's your view on this, Joe? Well, I think that you're right about the work situation. If you work for a massive company like yours, there's no way they're going to let you bring in your own computing device. You're stuck using either a thin client or at least a, a totally locked down machine that's almost definitely going to be running Windows. So I think that for your average person, it's probably not going to be as Will suggested. But I always come back to the point that I think convergence is going to be a bit of a niche area, really. I don't think it's got the the huge mass appeal that Canonical and indeed Microsoft hope it has. I think there'll be a lot of people who will take advantage of it like this, but by a lot of people, I mean perhaps thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands, not millions and billions. And I sort of wonder how you define whether it is you know, a successful or a recognized thing, because let's say, for example, Logitech or Lenovo come out with a dock, which, you know, a USB-C type connector can plug into, does that mean the convergence is incredibly popular? Or does that mean that Lenovo could sell a few tens of thousands of these docks and therefore they make them? Whereas if you look at their mouse range, there's like 30 different mice because everyone needs a mouse. So I mean, just saying that a dock has come out by a big manufacturer, if it happens, doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has flocked to convergence. It's just that there is a niche and they are able to make docks that people will use and you've got to think about the variety of devices out there i mean i'm sure we will see some docks 
but the sheer number of different handsets and the regularity with which they're upgraded, and we were talking about this in the earlier in the news, I mean, I, the number of docks that would need to be available from every manufacturer to support those, because they keep moving where the ports are and the actual dimensions of the phone and what have you, an absolute nightmare. I mean, the only way I can see this working is if the whole thing is wireless, and there would have to be an agreed open API for everyone to write to to make sure that the video and the mouse clicks and everything are done in a structured and compatible way. Well, as I said last time we talked about this, you need to have a wired solution working perfectly before you can move to wireless. I mean, if you think about for years, we were having to have wired connections with Ethernet and all of that work that went into TCP IP and, and all that needed to be, that groundwork needed to be laid in order that we could then move on to Wi Fi. So I think that it would be a mistake to try and go straight for wireless convergence. I think you need to go through that wired generation first before we can get to the, the real exciting stuff of wireless. Well, yeah, but you look at KDE Connect and that seems to be doing pretty well through wireless alone. Ah, well, we'll get back to that later on. And uh, no doubt this convergence topic is going to rumble on and on and on, much like the topic of ad blocking. And Robert Orzana on Twitter said, maybe an interesting question for Linux Luddites. Does using Adblock Plus mean free riding the internet at the expense of others paying? And I would be inclined to agree with Robert. Yes, it does mean that. And I don't really care because I'm one of the people free riding. I think potentially it means something worse than that because Adblock Plus is now joined with Adblock and they're part of the extortion racket that are taking money from advertisers to let ads through. Every time this comes up, you bring that point up, Paddy, that they're basically running a protection racket. And I suppose that it's fair because... They are. Well, they yeah, they are. But and most, <laughs> most people don't change the defaults, but you can change the defaults. You can turn all that stuff off. You can add individual rules to your ad block list you don't have to let them through yeah but you can turn off all the tracking stuff in windows 10 but people still grumble about it don't they well yeah because people generally don't change defaults so i suppose yeah. that makes the argument valid to some extent yeah <laughs> some extent. <laughs> that's the best you're going to get out of him buddy. i think Take it, it probably is yeah <laughs> i don't know we, we still seem to be stuck in a view though that advertising is the only way to fund content on the internet and the tweet caught my eye because sort of the same day or so i read a blog post that was suggesting that we've really got ourselves in a big hole here because we view advertising as the main way to fund content on the internet and if that hadn't happened everyone would be quite happy paying for stuff or taking free content if people were happy to provide that as well but that's not the reality of the situation we find ourselves in the fact is that almost everything on the internet is free. And some people occasionally have tried to use paywalls to varying degrees of success. But like, take this podcast, for example. I was speaking to a friend who's totally technically illiterate about it and uh, about the kind of the, the relative success in terms of number of downloads. And he said, well, why don't you just charge a pound for each show? And then you'd be rich. And I just, that is just such a laughable idea. If we tried to charge money for this, then about 10 people would probably download it. You know, it, content has to be free at the point of delivery with either adverts supporting it or a donation model. I, I just don't think that anyone, well, I mean, I suppose you could say, look at Netflix and, uh, and Amazon Prime and stuff. People are paying ongoing subscriptions but isn't that for kind of big hollywood stuff rather than independent broadcasters and content creators i think one of the differences is that something like netflix has got such a breadth of content available whereas shows like ourselves it's the show it that's all we do is we do this show and if you are providing a breadth of service you can get people to pay via subscription model the problem that we've always had on the net is actually be able to support the small independent people who are very niche and don't have that breadth of coverage. Does that make sense? I suppose so, yeah. So what's your answer this week, Paddy, to solve this problem? 
I'm still waiting for a sensible micropayment system to spring into life because everything that's been tried previously has fallen fairly flat, to be honest. Why have they? What, what have they done wrong? Things like Flatter. The problem I would say with Flatter is that I'd seen it on the web. I'd, I knew roughly how it worked, but until coming on this show, I didn't really see the detail of, of what was going on. And it's not a necessity to have it to micro pay for the content. So it's, it's still a good way of donating to websites that you want to donate to and that accept Flatter, but it's not getting you past a paywall. It's simply putting tips in a tip jar. And that's perhaps the difference. You need to force people to pay for content, but through micropayments, rather than have micropayments as a as a optional extra. But it doesn't matter whether you're talking about micropayments of a few pennies or a pound or ten pounds or whatever. If people are used to content being free, they're not going to start paying for it. There'll be a minority of people who want to support that content creator by giving them a bit of money. But the vast majority of people expect it to be free. And I'm one of those people. I consume a lot of content. In my case, it's mostly audio and podcasts. And it, just the default is that it would be free. And then I hear about some of these kind of famous people like Ricky Gervais or whatever charging for it. And that just seems laughable to me. Yeah, but I wonder whether, <laughs> I wonder whether we're the problem because you, myself, and Paddy, we will sit in our own time and do this for the enjoyment and the, for the fun of doing it. And I get to look at Linux and, and I try different things I wouldn't necessarily have tried had I not been on the podcast and people write in. And, and you feel like it's a good group of people getting together and it's nice to listen to the community and things like this. It's done out of, out of love, not out of needing to pay the bills. But Ricky Gervais is a entertainer and a comedian and he has to pay the bills and so so every time that he is saying things which are funny he needs to be paid for that and so his podcast will need to be paid for and you say you know or let's say there's podcast x that you enjoy if they're doing it out of the love of making podcasts like we are then of course it's going to be up for free of course you're not going to put it behind a paywall but if you're a, a big news corporation or or maybe a a website like ZDNet or The Verge or something, you would almost expect their podcast to be paid for. The only reason it's not paid for is because it drives people to go to their site and look at the adverts that are there. Do you see what I mean? Like we're doing it for free because we can. Yeah, but it'd be nice to get paid to do this and to be able to do it full time and dedicate, you know, the whole working week to it. That'd be great. Well, the point that Robert there made is about him using ad blocks or people using ad blocks and and whether that takes away from the funding model and we've been discussing other funding models and opera and talking about including a native ad blocker uh, i think apple are talking about having ad blocking on their ios devices and as ad block becomes a more known thing and more people have it i i I know of the, the scientific method whereby you think, what if this becomes 100% and what if this becomes 0%? What if you, you go to the two extremes? And so let's go to the extreme that everyone in the world has an ad blocker. What happens then? What happens then, in my answer to that, is that you can't use advertising as a form of paying for things. And so it forces someone or some group or entity to come up with an alternative option. And is that not maybe what we want to happen? It's maybe what we want to happen, but it won't happen, will it? Because the people who have control over so much of the content currently and our use of the internet, people like Google and Facebook, their business models are based on all of this advertising. So they are never going to allow it to become a subsidiary function. But they can't stop us putting ad blocks in. They can't, but I mean, if... I can see a future where ads are served by Google. I mean, they're already pushing them out over secure HTTP. I can see a future where they're being served from the same domain and the same IP address as the Google search engine so that when they are served over HTTPS, you've got no way to differentiate the two and you cannot block them at that level then. So you talk about an arms race. As ad blocking becomes more sophisticated, so do the advertising agencies like Google. 
Yeah, I think that's fair. And it's really why I get hung up on mesh networking and peer-to-peer and such like, because we do need to take away these services from the big providers if we're going to have any control over our internet use in the future and our communications use in the future. And it's kind of why I was a little bit distressed earlier when we were talking about the FSF and the fact that they're dropping their BitTorrent sync clone, if you like, because it is exactly technologies like that which offer us the chance of a brighter future out of the grasp of these large corporate entities. Well, here's hoping that someone's actually working on that right now. And I'm sure if they are, someone will let us know about it. But that'll do it for the feedback then. Let's move on and talk about KDE. We're now joined by Jonathan Riddle, who was a developer at Kubuntu and is no more, and is now a developer of uh, Upstream KDE. And we talked to you, well, I talked to you a little while back, but it's great to have you back on the show, so welcome. Good evening, thanks for having me. So last time we spoke, it was kind of in the eye of the storm almost of the row and brouhaha you might call it that you were having with the ubuntu community council and canonical and it was kind of unclear we left it as you saying that you weren't quite sure exactly what was coming in the future and so i mean i think that's a reasonable place to start then i mean what kind of happened after we spoke you you did ultimately leave kubuntu I don't know, can you fill us in on, on what happened? Uh, well, not very much happened. Um, we had a meeting, there was a online call between the Ubuntu Council and the Ubuntu Community Council, and that was billed as a looking for a way to move forward, but they didn't present any way to move forward, and I'd long since run out of ideas for how to move forward, um, and they just wanted to put me on my place. So I kind of reason my place probably wasn't to hang around Ubuntu very much, so... I didn't. Um, so I put out the next Kubuntu release, uh, fifteen ten, and then haven't spent much time on it since, which is a shame. But things move on. Yeah. So you did hang around a little bit, um, as you say, to do that release. Was that kind of all work that you'd had in progress anyway, and you just kind of felt that you wanted to draw a line under it with that? Mm, so we we were working on the fifteen ten release at the time, and didn't want to just abandon it and um and as part of the ubuntu community policy is that members step down gracefully um and it's just not very helpful to grump off to anybody um so i i finished the 1510 release and and meanwhile we were working on plans for uh new projects and I've now I've moved on and so do you think that Kubuntu, in your absence, is going to be okay. I mean, you, you seem to be quite a big part of that project. Uh, sadly, I've, I have no idea. There's still a few people working on it, and because there are how ha- many thousand, ten thousand million users out there who use it, um, so some people don't want to abandon those users, quite rightly, um, but whether or not they'll have the, the power to make it as strong as it used to be, I don't know. Um, you just have to wait and see. So a big topic at the moment is ZFS and whether that's going to be on Ubuntu or not, specifically in 16.04. Is that going to be available in KDE Neon? And I mean, what do you think about that whole thing? Are are Canonical right in their assumption that it's fine to bundle it in and don't worry about it? Uh, Canonical are entirely incorrect. They're breaching the license of Linux, but they've been breaching the license of Linux for a number of years now. Nobody's particularly called them up on it, so they'll you know, just continue to do that. Um, and that's a real shame, but yeah, it's a limited amount that I can do with it. But with the fact that KDE Neon is based on Ubuntu, I mean, surely that means that there's a decision to be made there. Yeah, I'll, I'll remove it, of course. I'll obviously remove the, the binary files from that, because that's a breach of the license of Linux developers, and we de- that's a very generous license that they've given us, and we depend upon that license, and I don't want to don't want to be a pirate and break that license. So that kind of leads on to KDE Neon. Now, from what I can tell, as a something of an ignorant user, because I am not, uh, I haven't got much experience with KDE. It it's based on Ubuntu, but with KDE, but 
um, instead of being kind of stuck with the old versions of things, it, it rolls forward. It's well, it's not rolling because it, it's based on the LTS, but you do get the newer versions of things. Is that the correct read on it? Yeah. So it's a package archive of KDE packages directly from KDE. Uh, so when we were um, hanging out in Venice Beach on LA, wondering what would be an interesting way to uh, fill a, a need for the users of KDE, uh, we realized that KDE didn't supply its packages directly and always went through third parties, and this had various downsides as well as various upsides. And there would be nice to supply packages of KDE software directly from KDE and using modern technologies to do it. So using cloud computing and Docker and, and the kind of DevOps continuous integration systems that have become very, very commonplace these days, it's relatively simple to set up a system where the software just gets continuously packaged and compiled as soon as it has to be. And that stops any kind of delay, which is a big problem in the way that Linux distributions and free software typically works, that people code on some interesting program and then they release the source code, but then it takes weeks or months for that to actually get into the hands of users. Or users have to add a particular archive that they have to know where to find it, and it's a bit faffy. Um, so we were hoping that this way, working directly with the community that makes the software, would be a better way to get the software to the users. And don't you think there's any risk of stability issues doing it that way? Yes, there will be, uh, which is why we want to add in whatever automated tests that we can. So unlike the previous Project Neon, for example, there will is automated tests that flag up when when files aren't installed or when build dependencies aren't built or when a uh, Lintian error checker um, flags up some error or other. Um, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done there, and so we'll, we'll always be looking at to do that kind of work. And it's a stable base, is, is of course the idea. It's, it's not like a rolling distribution where everything is changing. Uh, this is intended for people who are fans of KDE software. And so the base system, the foundation, will be stable and, and not updating, which means that it's a lot less scary to use than just using a full rolling distribution. Yeah, and as you mentioned earlier, Jonathan, this is based on Ubuntu. And I think a lot of people found that slightly strange, bearing in mind the checkered history you've had with Ubuntu. I mean, what led into that decision-making process? Well, Ubuntu's good technology. I mean, there's a good reason why I always wanted KDE to be part of Ubuntu, which is that it, it was good technology, an important part of the ecosystem, and it's popular, and it has third-party support, and it has an awful lot of users. So it's a very useful system to base upon, and it has the... Uh, every two years, it has the long-term support edition, which gives a stable foundation, but it's still useful after those two years because it has... Uh, has enough drivers, backport, and so forth, that it's still a perfectly useful operating system. And I don't want the users to miss out. And we're familiar with it. Um, I know how it works, and uh, so may as well keep using it. But what about the fact that you... Well, you, you're not a big fan of Canonical, are you? I mean, I, I know that obviously you're saying that it is proven technology and it, it works, but aren't you concerned about well aren't you still concerned about some of the intellectual property issues that canonical have got going on and um you know what your concerns about donations as well i mean th that's i suppose what paddy was trying to get out there it just it seems a bit strange that even though it's a, a good distro to base it, a good base i suppose you i, I, I don't know it, it just seems that maybe debian would have been more well we would have been less surprised if it had been Debian put it that way um, well the, everything in Ubuntu is free software I'm an archive admin and I spent the last decade I continue to spend uh, time making sure that any package that's uploaded to Ubuntu is licensed so there's no licensing issue there for us uh, because everything is licensed under under well established free and open source licenses um, Canonical has their issues with the licenses, but that's a matter for them to to work out how they can fix the problems they created there. There's nothing to do with us. And the technology is good, and so we'll continue with the technology, but with a, with a very friendly KDE community. And of course, the KDE community is making conscious effort to reach out to other distributions as well, aren't they? Yeah, so there's a new distribution outreach program, and that's 
come out of the various discussions that came around discussing Kitty becoming a community that hosts a range of different types of projects and working out how Kitty can get its software to users in the best way. And of course, distribution is very important in that. Uh, so some people have started the distribution outreach program, which is just a, a mailing list, a way for different distributions and packagers to be able to discuss with their upstreams the, the problems and concerns and share experiences and so forth. Community organisation is something I'm actually quite interested in because it's something I don't know very much about by way of the KDE community. How does that work, Jonathan? How does the KDE community work? Yes, I mean, uh, by way of lack of formal structure, if you like, and how decisions and directions decided upon. Uh, it's a pleasingly non-hierarchical project. Anyone can sign up for an account in it, and anyone can get a developer account with a reference from somebody else who is already a developer. And then once once you have a developer account, there's about 500 people, I think, who have that, uh, then you can contribute to any part of any KDE project without restrictions on it, uh, w- without technical restrictions on it. But of course, there are social restrictions. Every project will have um, a preferred workflow for people submitting fixes and bugs and uh, preferred um, informal or occasionally formal, but usually informal management structure in terms of who's the person to go to if you if you want to discuss work on some bit of, bit of code here or there. And it KDE uh, hosts a whole range of projects. And obviously the Plasma Desktop is a flagship project that we're best known for. And the, the frameworks, the libraries, a lot of the code has gone up to Qt now. We had KDE Libs back in the day. Um, and that included a lot of code, which was perfectly good for other people. And since Qt has opened up as a project that anyone can contribute to. A lot of the code from Kitty Libs has moved up into Qt. Um, but we still have frameworks, which are all the libraries, and we still have Kitty applications, which is just a, a suite of, uh, I think, 200 different applications that get released every few months. Um, and there's individual applications that release in their own time, and there's projects who work on uh, Android and like iOS. So we, we ported Qt to to these platforms as part of KDE projects. Um, and then those projects moved on into upstream, as it were, or, or into Qt when it became the, that they were very useful projects, but they were better hosed, housed directly in Qt. And we have uh, other projects like OwnCloud started up as a KDE project, and that kind of outgrew us, and, and it's because they got, they got an awful lot of venture funding for their project. But they've been very successful, and... Um, and there's even projects like Wikis. So we have Wiki to Learn, which is a educational wiki for university students, uh, which is very popular now. And that's creating good collaborations with different uh, outside projects. So just now, the, there's a sprint happening at CERN, at the running around the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. And that that's put together by the Wiki to Learn people, but also the Plasma teams and a few other teams from within KDE. So they can all work together for this week to see what interesting ideas they come up with. So it's a, it's a very broad community, and there's very little formal structure, and everyone is very welcome to join with just a, a word from somebody else who's already in it. And we think this is one of the most successful open source communities there is out there. Oh, it undoubtedly is. I mean, it was the non-hierarchical aspect I was sort of interested in because I was curious how how the overall direction, if you like, of things like plasma um is arrived at those of us on the outside see something very unified as you mentioned there's an awful lot of projects there that all plug together and can work in conjunction with each other and i was just trying to get my head around how it that communication and coordination is achieved a lot of that will be up to the individual project how that individual project wants to organize itself and what its particular vision is for uh for the products that it produces uh within kde and of course, we have conferences and sprints and so forth, and that lets people discuss what should be the main focus over the next year or however long. And then we have the Academy Conference, which everybody comes to uh, in the KDE community, or as many people as they can. And that makes sure there's plenty of collaboration between the teams uh, of different projects. But you've not mentioned democracy there at all. Do, do you have votes on things? Uh, very rarely. On the whole, if you have to vote on something, that means there's a disagreement. So that's a bit of a that's a bit of a failure. So it's a lot nicer just to have have unity or to find, as we Quakers say, the spirit of the meeting and the way forward. 
So we very occasionally have votes on something. For example, Neon. There was a vote on whether or not Neon should be a KD project uh, because there was quite a lot of discussion about that, and the vote was largely in favour of it. And so people have agreed on that. But there's a lot, of lot of discussions as well about the vision for KDE and should it continue expanding uh, its scope in terms of the number of projects or the, or the style of projects that it hosts, or should it have a more focused style of project? And that's an ongoing discussion within KDE. Just to wrap up this organisational side of things, if you like, how does Blue Systems fit into this? I mean, I believe you're currently employed by them, and several other KDE developers are as well. And they're famously um, taciturn, if you like, in the public sphere. There's no particular secrets with Blue Systems. We're just uh, some people who want to help out KDE and have some fun and hopefully produce some interesting projects while we do it. So there's a guy called Clemens is behind it. It's the nice guy with deep pockets, and you can find out about him on Wikipedia if you particularly want. But we just want to work on what is useful and interesting in the KDE world. And so it's essentially philanthropy is what we're talking about. Uh, yeah, to a large extent. There's no particular business plan behind it, and we want to work on something that, that's interesting and fun. And some of it will be useful, and some of it, who knows where it's going, like Plasma Mobile, we, we launched our own uh, mobile variant of our of the Plasma desktop, and that's, that's in some ways a very pioneering project in that it's the only community-made project for a phone that uses the, the normal Linux stack, and which is it's the continuation of the convergence idea that KDE started with KDE 4, which was that one code base could be used on many different form factors. But will it go anywhere? Who knows? It, it's just we're having some fun. Well, it certainly has gone somewhere already. I mean, I tried it out when you first announced it, and then I tried it out earlier this week because I knew we'd be talking to you, and it has come on leaps and bounds in seemingly not very long at all. Uh, which is great, and there's only a few developers, one or two, working on that. Um, so it's a really nice showcase for how using KDE's technologies and technologies that KDE software tends to use um, you can get really good results without putting in an awful lot of time. Uh, it's funny you mentioned the word convergence there, which obviously Ubuntu are very well known for pushing. But you see that as a kind of, the, the, as you said, the code running, the same code running on all devices. I mean, what about this idea of plugging in your phone to screens and, and peripherals and only having one device? Is that something that it, you are aiming for with this? KDE started the idea of convergence in KD four times, which was 2006, was it really 10 years ago? I can't remember now, could have been. Uh, with the idea that single code base could be used on many different form factors, and and there's proven a success in that, uh, but of course the, the eternal problem that community projects like us have is that there's no particular close involvement with the hardware manufacturers and the, the people with the supply chains and so forth who can actually get the devices in front of users. So it, there's been very minimal commercial success there, which is a shame. But the technology is really good. And, of course, it's, the idea has been taken on by other people as well, which is always flattering. You asked about a phone, a single device that could be used in multiple yeah. places. And, and we haven't... Yeah, I'm not aware of anybody in KDE who's working on single device, uh, multiple apps, as far as I know. Okay. And KDE Connect, I suppose, ties into that as well, doesn't it? Yeah, KDE Connect's a really nice project where uh, a bit of software running on your Plasma desktop and a bit of software running on your phone, and it's, it's made for Android, but there are people are looking at ports to iOS and whatever else, uh, which just means that the two talk together in various useful ways. Uh, once you have it set up and you get used to using it, then you, you won't want it to go away because it's really nice that when somebody calls you, your, your music silences and you get a message on your desktop saying you've got a call now, or when you get a, a text message that, you, that it pops up on your desktop, or here at home I have a projector, but my projector is on a shelf um, way above where I can't reach and the computer has to go up there, uh, but I can control the, the screen that the projector is showing me using the controls from Kitty Connect on my phone. Uh, so it's, it's just offers integration between your computer and your phone in various nice ways. And are there many people working on that then? Uh, Albert Vaca is the main guy. He he was at the KDE office in Barcelona um, 
and I think he's now working in America somewhere, and, uh, and I don't know how many other people are helping him, a few, but I really couldn't give you exact figures. But you, you mentioned people in the KDE office there. Roughly how many people are actually paid to work on KDE then, on a kind of, you know, that's their job basis? I think not that many people are paid to work on KDE software. The, the joy, of it, the joy of it is that it's done by people who are uh, enthusiastic about it and doing it for the love of it. Um, so there's maybe only, only a dozen people or so who are paid, depending on your definition. But a, a huge number more doing it on a voluntary basis then. Right. And it's a good way to help the world, but it's also a good way to help yourself in terms of what well, you get, you're writing this application, which presumably you have a, feel a need for. Um, but it's also a really important learning experience. So any developer or student will need to work out how programs work in the real world. And the best way to do that is with open source software so that you can see, oh yeah, that's, that's how you code a program like that. So it, I'm always a bit amazed by people who come out of university never having worked on any open source software because it means they haven't worked on anything beyond what their university lecturer happens to have taught. Um, and I think it's a really, really important way for the world to, for developers in the world to be able to learn their skills. You're talking about real world uses of your software there, Jonathan, and the pragmatism involved in connecting to different operating systems is something that we've talked about as well with KD Connect. And Shashlik is getting a lot of press these days. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Shashlik is a project from Blue Systems, and it's an example of a project where you just want to play around and see if something interesting will come out of it. So a couple of developers worked on the setup that would allow you to run Android applications on a, on a normal Linux desktop. Um, of course, Android is... Linux, but then the whole rest of the stack is very different from what we what we normally think of our setup. So Android applications can't typically run on on your desktop, um, but using Shashlik, then that means that they can run it. And uh, and I saw a demonstration of it a couple months ago, and it was pleasingly successful. And it had Flappy Birds, and it had interesting chat applications that that interacted with the camera and whatnot. So all that seems to work, and it means that Android developers, of course, will have a another way to test their applications while they're developing it, and it means that people who just want to run an Android application, like maybe you want to run Duolingo and you want to learn Spanish, but you want to run it on a bigger screen, then it means that you can just do that. And it's not a KDE-only project, is it? Because it, it integrates with the menus of other desktops. Mm -hmm. But, of course, KDE software integrates with many desktops. Um, we provide one desktop, Plasma Desktop. Uh, the rest of our software, we like to think, integrates nicely with uh, whatever other desktops people use and works on whatever platforms the relevant developers want to work with. Yeah, I think it's a shame we still see some distributions out there that decide they're Qt or GTK only, and they're really missing out on an awful lot of good technology. And when I'm a packager, there are an awful lot of packagers say this is an audio application for GNOME or this is an audio application for KDE, but of course that's nonsense. You can use pretty much any application on any other desktop, and uh, so long as the people set up the widget themes and whatnot sensibly, then it should all be transparent to the user. And uh, yeah, if it's not transparent to the user, then that's a bug as far as I'm concerned. So we talked a little bit about KDE Neon, but can you tell us more about it? I mean, who is it aimed at, for example? Um, our target market is people who are enthusiastic about KDE software and people who care what desktop and applications are on their, on their system, which most people out in the world don't. Um, most people just want to run a web browser and, and, and actually do stuff with their computers. But of course, the type of people who install Linux distributions tend to be the type of people who are enthusiastic about what their operating system is and what their what desktop they run and um, and run the latest version of the applications. Uh, so it's it's aimed at the sort of enthusiastic people who um, who are most of the users of of desktop Linux. And uh, specifically of course it's aimed at people who want to get the latest KDE software. So people who read Planet KDE or KDE.news and see an announcement going KDN Live, our video editor has 20 new features and 20 new bug fixes and everyone should upgrade. And it's the kind of user who wants to up, who reads that and wants to upgrade and doesn't want to wait however many weeks 
to to get it available for them. Or indefinitely if you're stuck on an LTS. Right. Um, and we'll have it available in a few different flavors. So we'll have an archive for developers built directly from Git from the unstable branches that will be a little bit scary and a little bit risky, um, but it's for people who want to actively develop KD software or actively report bugs on it. So if you come across a bug and you report it, it's often not that useful to developers because often that bug's already been fixed um, because there's have much lag between you using the software and the software being written and released. So if you're, you're the sort of helpful person who wants to report bugs and help out the open source community, then uh, you can install our packages and you'll know that that's the exact code base that the developers are working on and that your bug is still important and it means that when that bug gets fixed that an update will be available and and that can be quickly tested so there can be a, a quick feedback cycle between developer and uh, the bug reporter. And we'll also have a user edition which has packages based on the release sources that developers have said this is, this is good stuff and this released version and the stuff that's intended for users to have. Seems to be a little bit of a trend in the Linux ecosystem generally of moving away from the traditional packaging mechanism. I mean, things like LibreOffice now are pushing out their own versions, so you're not waiting on the actual distribution for a new version of that. And this is another example. I mean, do you see it as a wider trend? Well, yeah, I, I hope so. I think it's there are all sorts of different reasons why Linux on the desktop hasn't taken off as a, as a big force in the world. But one of them will be that the, the people who develop the software don't control you actually being able to get it. And that's just silly. And uh, and so hopefully various projects will move towards a, a way where people can actually get it directly from the people who write it. And I, I think slightly longer term, what will happen is containerized applications will start to become useful and take off. And that means that people can, anyone can make a package of the application which works on any Linux distribution. And that means that users can install any application without having to wait for somebody else to to compile this and package it up. And so at the moment, if you go to the download page, I'm just looking at it now, uh, you've got the user edition and developer edition, and you've got these direct download and torrent download buttons, but they're frustratingly grayed out. So, I mean, is, is there a clear timeline on this? I mean, you say it's going to be based on 1604, so presumably you're going to have to wait for that to come out first then? Not necessarily, but also maybe. Um, I'm afraid I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm not foolish enough to think, to think that it's possible to give deadlines in software development. Uh, yeah. we're, we're trying something new that I haven't done before, so it's impossible to say. But I'm working on installable images just now, and uh, and Hal Sitter is very good in working on packages being built. We have packages that are built from developer Git branches, and you can use those now. And he's working on packages being built from stable Git branches, so again, those are for developers who want to test the bug fix releases. Um, and then he'll work on packages being built from release sources. And uh, that should all be available in coming weeks rather than months. That sounds good. And it says for the user edition, ideal for everyday users. So this isn't just a showcase to, to kind of show the latest stuff. This is designed to be used uh, as a daily driver on a daily basis. Mm, yes, you can use it as your daily desktop, but only if you're the sort of person who doesn't mind features suddenly appearing one day that where they weren't before, or um, buttons suddenly moving around because because the next version of the software happens to have some different buttons installed. Um, so if you're the kind of user who who enjoys that, who's enthusiastic about that, then that's absolutely for you. But you wouldn't recommend it for, say, someone who'd never used Linux before and were, you know, for example, I set up machines for people. They say to me, oh, my Windows machine keeps slowing down and all this. And I say, well, try Linux. It, it doesn't sound like the kind of thing that I would use for that scenario. Probably not, um, because most people, you don't, you don't install Linux on their computer and then they'll, and, and they'll take a wee while to get used to it and then they'll just get used to it and it'll it'll work um, but most people just want to open up a web browser and be able to use Google um, but of course if features are changing underneath them then they'll, they'll find that a bit random and frustrating and, and get a bit fed up with it so I, I suspect that kind of user it's not suited for um, but remains to be seen but if people do want to try it at the moment they can do so in uh, Kubuntu 15.10 then 
Mm -hmm. You install um, any Ubuntu flavor uh, 1510 and add the archive and uh, install Neon Desktop. And that will get you the latest packages. And uh, still early adopters, and there's, there's been a couple of bugs that that our early users have had to work around, and, and I thanks to them for doing that. Uh, but for the most part, it should be pretty stable and usable. And so we've talked about having up-to-date applications, like you talked about Caden Live and, and stuff, but it will also be the desktop itself gaining features. Uh, right, so at the moment, it's only the desktop. We only have packages of KD Frameworks, Qt, and Plasma uh, to keep it simple while we get things up and running. So at the minute, there's no applications uh, that we compile, but that will be added shortly, and so that'll be all the 200 odd KD applications and then all the extra gear and applications which get released individually well all of this sounds very exciting and it's almost enough to sway me to try and out kde again i think because i'm pretty diehard gtk with xfce and uh, and mate and that sort of thing but it's been brilliant having you on the show jonathan thanks so much for coming on and talking to us and, and giving your time and uh I look forward to speaking to you again at some point uh, thanks for having me and i hope you will get over your your preference for one particular widget toolkit and uh, <laughs> learn about the wider community out there <laughs> you never know thanks Jonathan well we do sometimes get accused of not speaking about KDE and totally ignoring it so there we go we actually had a proper interview about it and as we said in that interview th there is quite a lot going on with the KDE project that is quite exciting and I alluded to it towards the end but it is tempting to give it a proper go, you know? Yeah, I think I don't really give KDE enough of a chance. I enjoy the desktop in interface, but it's all of the applications that I don't use. And this is the whole point of Neon, is that it's trying to show off the newest and latest KDE applications. And I generally default to the ones that I know from GNOME. And so you're right, if you're going to use Neon, you should stick with all the applications that start with K, no matter how badly they've forced it and crowbarred it into the name. I did make a, a few notes whilst listening to the interview, and I quite appreciated his sort of pragmatic view on using Ubuntu and the fact that he's familiar with it. makes It makes a lot of sense. And also removing ZFS to, to avoid the licensing issues, clearly that's a bit of a bee in his bonnet and and is falling very much on one side of the fence. But I, I thought what was really interesting was the discussion on a new or, or improved or maybe just a different delivery method of applications different to the the standard sort of packaging way that we do it now. And Paddy, your reference to how LibreOffice is releasing their latest versions and allowing users to download it directly from them. And I really think that is, you know, it's a change that we're seeing coming, especially with containers and Docker and ButterFS and things like this. There are ways of installing applications which is different to the the standard sort of repository model. Yeah, and hopefully I'll have more sensible dependency management as well. I mean, I've got to be honest, that's one of the reasons I don't tend to use any KDE apps is because you try and install one and whoever the package maintainer is wants you to bring down about half the desktop with it um, as opposed to just what it strictly needs. Yeah, it's always a massive list, isn't it? Every time, and you know, once you've installed one KDE application, you might as well just carry on installing different ones because you've got so many dependencies already installed. Whereas you pick something else from another desktop and it's not so bad. Or I guess maybe that's a bit unfair because I always look at it as a GNOME or a GTK-based desktop pulling in KDE applications, whereas maybe I've not looked at it from the other side of the fence. Yeah, if you've got the Plasma desktop running, then presumably it'd be very light download for most of these applications because you've got all the dependencies already. No, I mean, if you were on the Plasma side and trying to download a GNOME application... Oh, right, yeah, yeah, then you'd probably have to pull down loads of stuff as well, yeah. But also, on back onto the interview, was the, I, I'd never heard so much talk about Blue Systems. It always seems to be this, I don't mean shady in a negative way, but kind of shady operation that you're not quite sure what they're doing or, or who is pulling the strings or why they're funding, uh, is it Netrunner? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and why they're sort of putting money into KD and things. But he seemed, you know, more than happy and, and quite open to chat about it. So that was good to hear. And 
There's also the the discussion about the the hardware and how it's difficult for a smaller operation to get hardware manufacturers on board. And it reminded me about that tablet that was that that painter tablet. You know what I mean? It's the name of the painter that was the KDE tablet. The Vivaldi. Yes. Okay, we're close. We're definitely close. Not a painter, a uh, composer. You ignoramus. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what I mean? That that had very high uh, expectations and promises. Or maybe it wasn't high. It was just new and interesting. And everyone sort of had news articles about it and things. And then it, unfortunately, never made it to market because the, the Chinese manufacturers that they were getting the hardware from changed the hardware and they'd spent their entire time uh, customizing it to run on the earlier version and things like this. And it's just disappointing to see that you can't be a small outfit making interesting and new software and get the hardware manufacturers on board. Yeah, it is a shame. But I think that that's the crux of it here, that KDE is a project that is about making interesting and exciting things for the sake of doing it, not out of any commercial goals or anything like that. It's just purely for the sake of doing it. And that, in a way, I think is what makes it so good, that they don't really care about that kind of stuff they just want to make the software that they want to make and it happens that we've been pretty down on that on this show historically but you know fair play to them but they make stuff they want to make and they're happy with it and you end up with some really exciting things like kde connect and to some extent plasma mobile which i said in the interview that it's come a long way i mean it's still not there yet but maybe it will be Maybe if more people start developing it, we could get a serious competitor to Ubuntu phone and maybe even get some convergence stuff going with that. But th- that's the point. that They're not trying to make some money out of it. They don't have that ultimate goal like Canonical, I suppose, has. And that's what makes it attractive to me. I think that's why at the end of the interview there, I said that I- I'm almost tempted to to get involved and start using KDE because I I do like that ethos a lot. Well, it's all very well and easy to say when there's a, a mysterious backer pumping money into it and you can have a bunch of people in a Barcelona office working full time, basically doing the Google 20% project all of the time. Of course, you're going to come up with interesting and quirky ideas and get a few people to try the KDE Connect, try and make a, a, a phone equivalent, you know, but if you actually have to do something that makes money, look at the uphill struggle that Canonical have had. Yeah, but I think that without the the backing, the, the mysterious money, I think that it would survive. It would be scaled back. It would have a slower development rate. But I think it would still exist and they'd still be doing some interesting things. Yeah, yeah, it would still exist. I mean, KDE was around before uh, Blue Systems got involved and, you know, it was all very much community developed. So, of course, they'd they'd be there. Whether they'd be able to do as many different things as they are or whether they'd have progressed to where the Plasma desktop is now, I'm not sure. But I I agree, it it would carry on with or without this funding. But overall, very interesting to, to hear his point of view and to hear where he thinks this Project Neon is going and what it's showcasing. So, well, maybe we need to have a look at this in the future. Yeah, sounds like a good plan. But with that, we're coming to the end of another Linux Luddites. You can email us at show at linuxluddites.com, find us on Twitter, Google+, Plus, or Facebook communities, or leave a comment on the website. Thanks for joining me, Paddy and Jesse, and thanks to everyone for listening. We'll see you again in two weeks with more Linux news, reviews, comment, and generally being grumpy. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, people. See you later.